Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Omar Tashman, founder and CEO of The Skills, an online education platform offering courses taught by the world's best athletes. In this episode, Omar explains how the company was able to partner with athletes like Michael Phelps, Maria Sharapova, and Megan Rapino. We discuss the challenges and opportunities in the ed tech space, including content production and competitors like Masterclass. And Omar shares his plan for building the definitive education platform in sports and wellness. Let's get into it. A quick reminder before we get into today's show. Every Tuesday, we send a weekly newsletter filled with insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Join other decision makers and industry operators by subscribing at insider.fit.co. Let's get into it. Hi, Omar. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. And uh, looking forward to chatting today. And I think just to kick things off, maybe introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about the skills. Yeah. So I'm Omar. For those who don't know about the skills, I guess I'm a serial entrepreneur. This is my third company I've been at from the ground up. And previously, I'd done, after Stanford, I actually did a robotics company that sold to Agilent and then went to business school. After that, we started a clean energy company called Clean Energy Experts. And that actually ended up selling to Sunrun. And so my background is definitely not in sports and it's definitely not necessarily as much in consumer, but I love the ed tech space. And so after uh, Clean Energy sold to Sunrun, I was in Japan. I uh, had been watching some of the other players in the ed tech space and I just thought it was fascinating. And so I came back to the States and one of my good friends is the uh, COO of the LA Olympics. And I just thought, okay, this is going to be a really interesting space. And I love the idea of verticalization in the space. And uh, that's kind of how the skills came about. So when you talk about robotics and clean energy, these are <laughs> ma- massive markets, right? And it's a, a huge transition to now kind of be in the ed tech and sports sector. How did you think about like, is this a big enough opportunity? How do we make this a big enough opportunity to kind of make it worth your while at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you just look at the scale, the potential scale of it, and you and you think about, you know, if you have this vision, which I I did, that in five ten years, a lot of it education is going to be online, and you're looking at how consumer consumption is happening, where more and more people are taking learning into their own hands, you start to realize, okay, there's a There's a really global play here. And if you actually look then at the supply side of the business and you say, well, you know, who is teaching? And you think, okay, Michael Phelps, you know, Maria Sharapova. And you start to say, like, who wants to learn from them? I mean, in the old days, right, if you wanted to have a chance to see a a big name like that, you'd have to really go to a camp. And it was, you know, you might have to go to Michigan to, to the Michael Phelps camp and you know, you you pay a lot of money for that and you have this chance to just maybe interact for a few minutes. So, you know, when you sort of take that approach and you you ask yourself, well, how does this potentially scale into the future? I I just think the opportunity seemed massive. And obviously our vision is, you know, as much as it is about the opportunity from a business standpoint, you know, everyone will speak about the democratization of, of this knowledge and being able to kind of take, I've used this example before is someone once said to me, how great would it have been if we had, you know, Muhammad Ali teaching a jab, you know, or the late, or the great late Kobe Bryant teaching the jump shot, right? It's, it's something that we're tapping into is just kind of the legacy and the democratization of that knowledge as well. So yeah, I think the opportunity is there. And I think there's plenty of people around the world that are, are really excited about what we're putting together. For sure. And before we get into like some of the specifics, how long you've been working on it? How big is the team? How much funding? So some of those uh, contextual items. Yeah, sure. 2019, I started putting it together. We did a friends and family round in 2019. And then we did a seed round in 2020. Total funding, just a little bit over 6 million. And the team right now is, is pretty lean. We're at 11 people. And we launched, we went live in September 2020. So about eight months ago. Yeah. So still early. You talked a little bit about coming up with the idea and seeing the opportunity. 
I think one of the kind of obvious questions might be, you know, how are you getting these people like Michael Phelps and Maria Sharapova interested to, I think some are, are investors as well as instructors on the platform. So how are those connections made? How are you structuring those deals uh, to get those athletes to want to be involved? Yeah. You know, it's actually <laughs> kind of funny because a lot of people assume that I, I knew these athletes before, had some connections, and, and I didn't. I went in pretty cold and I, I mean, I had obviously some people who knew certain folks within the agencies, you know, you kind of have to, as with, as any entrepreneur, you gotta, you gotta find your way in. And so we were able to start to pitch the idea to the agencies. And at the end of the day, you know, even if you know an athlete directly, they're still going to have you go through their agent. So, um, we, we went into the, you know, all the major agencies at this point, we, most of them, we, we work with, whether it's CAA or Wasserman or Endeavor, which is IMG, William Morris and Octagon and so on. And the idea is what sold itself. It clearly wasn't Omar. It wasn't, you know, I mean, there are some situations where obviously, you know, an athlete might start a company and people come on board because it's, they know the athlete, but the idea really sold itself. And if you think about it, it's the category wasn't really there. So if you're an athlete and you're thinking about your brand and your business opportunities, you might have a sports drink deal. You might have a deal that's a clothing deal, right? A shoe deal. But there's really no one at the time going to them, asking them to teach. And so the ed tech space was pretty open and a lot of them believed in it. And so to the point at which when we started having these discussions, some of them wanted to be more involved than just transactionally being a part of, you know, the actual teaching. So Maria Sharapova, in particular, when we started discussing, it just so happens she lives near me in, in Los Angeles, but I didn't know her. But her team had been thinking about this for a long time. So that the, the agency side and the athlete side, they're constantly, it's her job. They're constantly thinking about what's next. And fortunately, we were kind of at the right time to be able to have this great beachhead where we went out to some of the best athletes in the world in their respective sports. And they were very interested in being a part of it as well. So, you know, that's, I think, primarily what sold them on, on our vision. And of course, as we were very interested in having them be involved structurally, both, both there's a, a revenue share component for some of the athletes, there's a cash component for some of the athletes, and there's an equity component for some of the athletes. And it's all pretty bespoke. So there's there's not one set way we do things, and and at least for when we started, uh, that worked really well because we were able to to make everyone pretty happy. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense, and obviously super valuable to have them bought in as instructors, as spokespeople, as investors as well. And just thinking about the kind of user customer side, what does that experience look like for me as a user? I come, I sign up. Do you have a sense for? who the audience is, what specifically they're kind of seeking out and, and maybe what's resonating with them so far. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've just this week, I'm, I was deep in user data on individual users and looking at exactly what's happening. Cause it's really, it was exciting time for us. You know, we're over 5,000 paying users at this point and, and we're pretty excited about their engagement levels. We were a little bit, you know, just like, as you can imagine with some of our competition, when you start and you've got three, four, five courses, what, whatever that might be, it's a very different story than where you might be in two, three, four, five years when you've got 100 courses, right? So we always expected that it was going to be a little bit tougher sledding at the beginning. We expected users would want more content. And the, the first thing we learned, which was a, a great validation of our thesis, is everyone loved the content that was in there. And the main question when we would ask people, what do you want? How can we be better is more, more, more. So we just want more content. And so that, that was, that was a, that was the first thing we learned. And, and it's, and it's something that we're every week at this point on, on average, every week we're adding new content to the, to the platform. We also had a thesis that because we were verticalized sports and wellness, that there would be a pretty high correlation of people that were interested in from one instructor to the next. So if you came in because you're a swimmer 
and you saw Michael Phelps's course when we released that in December, that when we released Megan Rapinoe's course next, or when we re- re- release, let's say, a baseball player, that of course you're interested in in Rebecca Sony, who's another swimmer that we just put out some content on uh, with. Of course, you're going to be interested in more swimming, but that you'd also be interested in some of the things that the other athletes had to say, because in part, and we can dive into this a little bit more about content, we have technical lessons, but then we have a lot of intangible lessons, leadership, teamwork, how people handle pressure when they're sitting at the top of the half pipe right before, you know, they've got a gold medal on the line, right? And and it's interesting because we see that when people are maneuvering through the platform, that they we have courses that are multi-instructor courses specifically curated around leadership and teamwork, for example, confidence and pressure, things like that. And we see them really diving into those. And it's actually been really interesting to see that we've started seeing some enterprise sales companies coming in and saying, oh, can we, can we buy this for, you know, X, Y, or Z? And a lot of their interest lies not in just the, the technical pieces of wellness and sport, but in the pieces that transcend sport. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. This is one of the questions that just personally, I you know came up playing high school and college football, got into endurance sports and triathlon. So like, kind of have an understanding of, to some extent with a sport, you can't really learn it by watching it. I mean, there are some things you can definitely learn and there are things that I would love to learn from Michael Phelps, for example, about swimming. But there are more things I think that's more interesting how did you deal with all this? How did you manage this? This is take me into the mind of an elite performer. And to your point, that transcends just like an athlete. It could be really applied to tons of different uh, domains. So how are you thinking about that piece? Like for people who sign up, are you saying like you're going to get better at a sport, like a tangible thing in terms of improving that performance? Or is this just the, the kind of tips and tricks and leveling up that comes with these kind of elite performers? Yeah. So I think there's an expectation on both sides. And we see, by the way, you know, we, we expected this, but we sort of see two major types of users coming to the platform. One is this adult user, 25 to 45, typically looking to just get better in all aspects of their life. And then we have youth sport participants. And they're a little bit different, clearly, and sort of, I think you could point to youth sports as being a little bit more tactical, really looking to sort of get, well, well we, of course, would impress upon them that all of the, the mental side is just as important. You know, you might see a little bit more of a lean towards understanding how to, you know, improve the breaststroke specifically in swimming. I think if you, it's funny, if you, if you actually took this to just how I've run my companies in the past, and you, it's, you know, how important is it to give somebody like a really, a KPI that they really can focus on? And so, yes, while there's, of course, we're not supplementing your coach that you kind of might go to on a weekly basis, to know that there's two things or three things that Michael Phelps will tell you if you want to be a great swimmer. He actually tells you one thing. If you want to be a great swimmer, do this really well. I, I think there's an aspect of, of course, you can improve by just understanding that you're doing all the other stuff you do day in, day out, but just knowing where that focus really needs to be. So, you know, I do believe that people can and will improve on the field. And we're very excited about them improving off the field. And we, we do have data on that. I mean, we have people who made their, watched Carrie Walsh Jennings volleyball course and wrote back to us that they had, hadn't made the varsity team until after they'd watched the course. And now they're they made varsity and that's, you know, those proof points are really cool and, and inspirational for us as a company. Yeah, for sure. It's like, uh, having the opportunity, of course, uh, with football, like many other sports film study is an essential part of it. So this is basically having film study and lessons with that elite performer over your shoulder or narrating or specifically guiding you through it. So that, that aspect of watching and learning is, is also kind of very important with that, you know, when you think about the content and how it's getting produced at its core, you mentioned, you know, kind of being an ed tech company to some extent, 
to a large extent, you're also a content company. So there's a ton that goes into it from a production side. It has to be high quality. What are the lessons that are coming out of it? So I guess two things that I wanted to, to ask you there. One, how are the, how much are these productions costing in terms of the team that's putting it together? And, and two, how much work do you guys have to do to structure this for some of these elite athletes? Maybe they're not kind of the best coaches or speakers or have not put together a course like this before, obviously. So what goes into developing that content? Oh, it's a, there's a lot to unpack here and it's really fun stuff. Actually, I, I, this is where I love having not come from the industry production industry. It's like those insurance ads where, you know, they sort of say, okay, well, we took a wholly different, you know, digital approach to this and we're way more cost effective because of it. And I think my background as a electromechanical engineer out of Stanford, the first couple of shoots we did, I looked around, I was like, why are there, why are there 45 people here? And it's, it's because I, I leaned on the people on the team that had done commercial production before. And that's just the norm. You know, there's a lot that needs to be done to, to make really high quality footage. But the good news is we started chipping away at that. And we started saying, so what's the value to the consumer? We're always thinking like, okay, what's the value to the consumer and what are they looking for? And every piece of feedback we've gotten from consumers within, you know, pretty much every piece of feedback, is the content is amazing and beautiful and great. We just want more of it. And so we said, okay, they're asking us for more. So when we're out there and it's like, we're filming for a day, we need to maximize content. You know, is it nice to get the perfect shot of the football coming into Larry Fitzgerald's hands and, and spending the time to take that shot over and over and over again? You know, no, we've got two or three, four cameras out there anyway, it's going to be a good shot. So let's really make sure that we have Larry talking a lot and getting the content across. So we've seen huge cost efficiencies, I mean, in the range of 10x in some of our filming. And you wouldn't, I could put the, I could put two next to each other to you. And from an ed tech perspective, you're going to, you're going to be happy and impressed. And I mean, I don't think we're winning Oscars per se, like that's not our goal. Our goal is to make people enjoy the content and learn from it. And so the second kind of part of the question, how much, you know, preparation kind of goes into it and how are we working with those athletes? You're right. Athletes are not coaches but there's a ton of great information in there. So, I mean, every time we're on our 20th instructor at this point, every, every single time we're discussing like, how do we pull out and extract the information more and more and more. And, you know, one of the things we do is a lot of times we'll have a technical advisor on shoot and the technical advisor is maybe a hitting partner. The technical advisor is a coach. When we worked with Michael Phelps, Bob Bowman was there. And that was hugely important. And that's all about extracting the right information. Do you have a sense, I guess, when it's happening, maybe at this point that you're on your 20th instructor and probably multiple different shoots within that, that we have gotten what we wanted? I guess what I'm trying to get to the punchline is like, have you had to pull a plug on a shoot? Be like this instructor, this course, this, whatever it is. And obviously you don't have to say the name, but like, it's not going to work just given what we're getting so far out of this production. Yeah, we've never had to pull. There's always good content within the, within every individual, and we also, you know, we do a lot of vetting beforehand to make sure, like, we feel that this is going to be a valuable piece of content for our for our users. But I will give you some. I will give you a non-specific example. We have gone through a course that we're filming, and sometimes, like, we're trying to get a little bit beyond just the obvious, right? If you're Michael Phelps, you can talk to us a lot about swimming, but Maybe we'll get into dry land techniques, right? And maybe if you're if you're Sean White, maybe people want to know about you know what you do off the hill, or maybe we, if you're Carrie Walsh, Jennings, maybe people want to know what your nutrition is. There have been instances where we've kind of gone into that second that ter- that secondary tertiary level, where the athletes turned to to me and said, "I'm just not feeling this. Like it's not my. I'm a football player and." I'm not quite a nutritionist. So let's, let's maybe I'm not, I'm not feeling as comfortable with what, what I'm delivering here. And that's totally fine because at the end of the day, one of the other really important things 
going back to the athlete side is there's a lot of debate about like approval rights, you know, like, and if it, we're actually very comfortable having the athletes have approval rights on it's their course and we want it to be authentic to them. So when we launch into these things, we tell them, don't be afraid to kind of go where you want to go because we want you to be happy with the course. So you, we want you to approve the episodes and the lessons. So if you don't say something perfectly how you want to say it, you know, we'll take care of that. And, or if you feel like something was one direction you didn't want to go, it doesn't happen very often though. So we're, we've been pretty lucky. Yeah, that's great to see and how that kind of process evolves within it. it turning our attention a little bit to, you know, the consumers, you you mentioned having launched about eight months ago, uh, there are 5,000 subscribers or, or users on the platform. How are you acquiring customers at this point? What's working and not working? And how do you think about continuing to to grow as, as you're adding more content and obviously want to add more users as well? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think the the plan has always been to take a on the channel approach to to growth and and customer acquisition. The good news is that we have some built in, you know, if I'm selling insurance, I have maybe a little bit harder time like getting people excited about, you know, the ads or the the social media that's happening, but I've got this great starting point of I've got some of the most recognizable people in the world teaching and 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 Still in some of the secrets of how what made them great, so that really helps. I mean, we obviously will. You've probably seen us on some of our Facebook, Instagram advertising. You've probably seen some of the posts from the talent we work with. But what we're actually really excited by is, you know, we we get a lot of kind of groups coming in, hearing about us, saying, "Hey, I'd love to. I have a swim team of fifty people, and uh, I'd like to, you know." get the course for the team. And then we have some enterprise sales and we don't even have a mobile app yet. So, so there, when we think about you know distribution and customer acquisition, there's the whole side most people think about, which is advertising, social media, organic growth. There's a B2B to C play here. There's a B2B play here. That's, you know, we didn't necessarily push that. It's kind of evolving naturally, which is great. But then there's also all the distribution channels, which we haven't really tapped into yet because that just takes time. You got, I mean, even with a masterclass, right? A lot of people look at the work we're doing and kind of see, see obviously a similarity. I don't think they had a mobile app for a couple of years. I don't think they were on Apple TV for a couple of years, Roku. So that that's also another part of the customer acquisition uh, strategy is just simply through the distribution channels. And, you know, our engineering team has got a pipeline there that obviously they're working on. Yeah, obviously it's a digital software content company. And at the onset, you kind of mentioned previously, you'd have to go to a camp to kind of experience some of these athletes. Is there any thought process, whether it's just community building, a cool activation that like, hey, maybe we'll do some of this offline, get some of these coaches together, bring people in, give them the opportunity to engage? Or is that, you know, uh, maybe it'd be a cool thing to do once in a while, but it's not really uh, something that would really move the needle? Yeah, I think with my lessons from my past companies have been stay pretty focused because I, so I think offline just presents so many challenges that we, we are not really considering that. I do think, I know for a fact that we have some really interesting interactivity products coming out where you can start to engage more one-on-one or maybe in a group setting with the talent, but those aren't launched yet. So I'll keep them to myself for now, but but I think that's the area that we're excited about. So if you think about us as a as a university, right? You have your you have your lectures, and I think our you can kind of think of our traditional video lessons as as the lecture. That person is talking to you about how you can become much better at that whatever it might be: swimming, confidence, pressure, handling pressure, all these things. Then. You have the office hours, right? Where you can get more one-on-one interaction. You can ask questions. And so that piece of the puzzle is coming and it's always been in the, in the plan and both sides of the equation, the talent and the, the users are both excited uh, about that from you know, our early information we've kind of gathered to our customer surveys and discovery. Yeah, super smart. Really tapping into making this a social slash community product as well. When you talk about being able to engage, is that kind of one 
to many, the instructor slash athlete to the users, or is that also among the users that maybe, Hey, I Both. live in, yeah. Okay. That's, I think that's really great. Yeah. How, how is that starting to shape up kind of in your mind? Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the goals for us is we're, we're going to try to try to actually offer a one-to-one opportunity for some of our, and see how that works for our users. And that's going to, that, I think that's going to be really cool. The second part of it around, you know, kind of a community, we do have discussion groups, we do have Facebook community and things like that. But, and this is really, and I think everyone knows building communities, if you're an entrepreneur, and it's, it's really hard. I mean, even some of the greats like Peloton, it's, it's, it's tough. So we think that ultimately ed tech lends itself to social sharing, to people accomplishing things, finishing courses, getting, you know, diplomas and credit and things like that, and feeling like they're just leveling up and sharing that at, at the peer level is, is something that we're going to continue to foster. And how that works is it's just still an evolution for us. We have the basics in place, but I, I frankly think we are, we're so early in the journey. It's an area that I, from even the onboarding, right? Like the day you sign up at this point, we ask you kind of some things about your interests, but I, I believe that there's a whole lot. And then you can go wherever you want. You can learn tons of stuff, but I just believe there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to foster that more than we do now. And, you know, I can't, can't do everything in, in, in the first year, but it's definitely a high priority as we, as we move forward. Yeah. A lot of those things is what we hear from operators kind of regardless of the, the focus or the industry or the company is the, the community aspect, the social aspect, and what you're talking about, like some, some of the personalization that comes along with that huge kind of ever growing, all consuming challenges. Yeah. So uh, a right. lot, lot to get to <laughs> on that front. Yeah. As we get to the end of the conversation here, one of the things that I did want to mention, we've kind of alluded to it a couple of times. You have companies like Masterclass, I think multiple billion dollar valuation at this point, which bodes super well for you, right? It's it's probably not a one-to-one comparison that you would make, but there are some similarities. And then you have other companies both on the ed tech side who are taking a similar approach. And you have companies in the kind of sports world that are taking a similar approach. I think a lot of them at this point are more specific to a vertical, we'll call it tennis or golf or, you know, what have you, but how do you think about that competition in general as others from a broader lens could move into sports as sports vertically focused could expand? Um, what does that evolution look like for you? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, this is, I've been asked this a lot, you know, during uh, kind of going through with the investors, how do we think about ourselves in comparison to masterclass? How do we think about ourselves in comparison to what you talked about, just some of the other players? You know, I actually, I really love the symbiotic nature in particular between us and the masterclass. I, I look at them as an NBC, right? You get a lot of content across a wide, wide variety of topics, a lot of discovery pla- platform for a lot of people. I look at us like ESPN, both incredibly successful and you know, the audiences are a bit different. So that's, that's something that I've always thought to myself as we go forward is I think David and what he's doing with masterclass is, is really groundbreaking. And I actually think that a lot of, obviously a lot of what I thought is important in ed tech, some of it comes from some of the stuff that, that they've been able to prove, which is that there is a lot of interest for this. And then I subsequently realized that verticalization of that in the, to sports and wellness has a lot of benefits too. I think there's a lot of, there's a really high correlation as we talked about earlier of interest. And, you know, I think in user engagement if, between swimming and, and tennis and this are, are pretty high. Um, and so far the data is kind of proving that out for us. As far as all the other competitors that are a bit more sports, you know, like focused on, on the single sport, let's say, sure. I think there, you know, that's, there's opportunity there for people to, to, to coexist in the, in the marketplace. And, but our vision, I, I feel very, I'm pretty excited about our sort of pole position right now. And I think our vision that you aggregate Michael Phelps and, you know, Megan Rapino and Sean, and, and you just continue building on that. It's going to be a place where people, I think a lot of people are going to be excited to come and, and learn both within the sport. And so we do focus a lot on depth within each sport, but of course, across sports and across, as we talk about technical and, intangible topics. 
Yeah, certainly an inspiring vision and one that, like you mentioned, uh, a lot to be done, but certainly an amazing opportunity. And I think we'll actually get you out of here on this. Uh, given that, and I think a lot of folks listening will be interested, what's the best way to follow along, get in touch, learn more about the skills? www.theskills.com. Uh, you know, we, uh, we should have the mobile app out soon. Uh, and that that's, I'm actually on my phone, but not no one else's yet. But um, yeah, just check us out on online. And yeah, uh, I think you, they can figure out how to contact us there. But ultimately, um, I mean, we're every single user, we're really excited to have on board and we're learning so much right now. I, I, I think of where we'll be in five years and it's just like a lifetime, it feels like. So, you know, we're being pretty, I, I like to think we're staying pretty humble. We know that it's, it's difficult building a good company. And so we're, we don't feel set in our ways. We feel we feel like we actually want to learn a lot from from our customer base and and our and our instructors as well. So we we welcome anybody who's interested in learning more. It's awesome. Hope folks check you out and kind of good luck as you continue to build to that towards that vision. And thanks for making a few minutes to chat with us today. All right, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.